Today I'll be talking about our project on identifying new epigenetic regulators of the Hawksmeath gene cluster in acute myeloid leukemia. And uh, before I get started, I'll introduce my background a little bit and where I come from. So I am originally from Tijuana, just here across the border. And uh, growing up, I was lucky to be involved with the Girl Guides, which are the Girl Scouts in Mexico. And I'm mentioning them today because uh, they really played a transformative role in in, in my life, and uh, that's how I got to know a scientist. And um, I would come to the Girl Scouts here in San Diego and do my activities in Tijuana as well. And uh, this is a picture uh, taken uh, at UCSD. This is Dr. Douglas Richman. Uh, he was very gracious and let a bunch of Girl Scouts uh, come visit his lab. And that was the first time I, I saw a lab. Uh, I was in high school. And I remember there was this scientist at the bench, like iPading and he turned around and he said like he was from Peru and to me that was like wow um, I, I like science but but in that moment I feel like um, it became uh, a goal and not just like this intangible dream so then I majored in um, biotechnology engineering I studied in Monterrey in Mexico and then um, I took part in a internship I had the chance to um, go to Canada to do research over a summer, uh, thanks to a program funded by the Canadian government um, called MyTax. And I liked it very much. That was the first time I had the chance to like actually you know, do research the whole day and, and not just take a lab as part of a class. And I really enjoyed it. I wanted to go to Canada again, and I was very lucky that my school had a partnership with UBC so I got a scholarship, a mobility award from funded by Scotiabank. And um, while I was there, um, I was lucky that the school was celebrating its centennial and they decided to have an epigenetics uh, symposium. And that's where I chose my current field of research. I thought it was super cool and um, I wanted to continue knowing more about it. And then I, also, while I was there, I wrote an email to a professor at UCSD, Dr. Francisco Villarreal, who allowed me to go and uh, shadow people in his lab to learn a little bit more. So the, the following summer, I was doing this uh, border commute and coming from Tijuana, taking the trolley, getting to UCSD, shadow students, uh, maybe touch a pipette, <laughs> do some things. So that was kind of the beginning of um, of why I chose this career and why I'm why I'm here, and now I'll actually introduce you to my research. So it's on epigenetics, and in our lab we are interested in acute myeloid leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood characterized by the excessive proliferation of immature myeloid blast cells that you can see over here, and this is how um, blood and AML patients looks like. Um, unfortunately, the survival rates remain very low for these patients, at, and they hover around 30%. And this really doesn't tell the whole story, because AML is a very heterogeneous disease at the molecular level. And to really be able to improve uh, the outcomes for these patients, we need to understand what is actually driving these different diseases that comprise AML. So that is why um, in our lab, we focus on particular subtypes of AML. And we study um, in particular one that is characterized by translocations in the AF10 gene located in chromosome 10. And when these, um, when the chromosomes translocate, they form gene fusions. And uh, AF10 gene fusions are found in pediatric and adult patients. There are no targeted therapies available for these patients and they face pretty poor prognosis. So these oncogenic fusions, um, we wanted to know more about them. And we wanted to know actually what was you know, really their transcriptional signature so we could find um, better ways to target what this uh, gene fusion, um, the programs that these gene fusions are driving in patients. So we collaborated with the target consortium that has a lot of RNA-seq data and here, if we compare AF10 rearranged AML to other AMLs, we found that they have a very notorious overexpression 
of the HOXA gene cluster as well as their cofactor MIS1. And this called our attention because it is already known that these genes are, um, are causal in leukemogenesis and that they are co-expressed and co-regulated. And even if they affect other subtypes of AML as well, and they are overexpressed, uh, we were pretty surprised to find that in the and rearranged AMLs, they were even higher. And we wonder if this, is, if this could be the reason for um, why these subset is of, um, especially of high risk. So we were wondering, could we target this gene cluster for, for therapy? And these genes are actually encoding DNA binding transcription factors, which makes them difficult to target pharmacologically. So an alternative um, that we are pursuing and that other labs have pursued as well is to find chromatin regulators of this gene cluster and to then propose new targets for more selective therapeutics. And while, as I mentioned, other labs have um, tried to find regulators, there has been mixed success in the clinic um, with the inhibitors that have already been developed. So the question remains open in our field and we wanted to take a bit of a more um, unbiased and systematic approach to find more regulators of this gene cluster. So what we did was that first we um, conducted a small molecule screen uh, here in our institute with the help of the Conrad Purvis Center of Clinical Genomics. We developed a reporter cell line for MIS-1. As I mentioned, these genes are co-expressed and co-regulated, so MIS-1 serves as a good reporter for the activity of the entire cluster. Um, and we did this, we made this reporter in U937 cells, which have an AF10 fusion. Um, we then used this small molecule inhibitor library and uh, did high throughput flow cytometry to look at the GFP levels, which would be um, reporting for the entire uh, cluster. So what we found um, was quite comforting because we did find known inhibitors of the Hoxmis genes, such as .1L and AF9 or ENL. However, we were a bit disappointed that we couldn't really find more, and there could be a couple of reasons for that. We know that there are more chromatin regulators at these two, from studies in other organisms, such as Drosophila, as this gene cluster is highly um, is very tightly regulated and conserved um, across species. And it could be that they're, they don't translate to mammalian cells or that there are no available inhibitors for them. So we wanted to extend our search and do it more comprehensively at the genetic level. And for that purpose, we made a CRISPR library to um, encompass uh, more classes of epigenetic regulators. And we also took a little bit of a non-standard approach uh, in the way that we designed guide RNAs targeting uh, all of the, ex um, the early exons of these genes, as well as their annotated domains. So we could try to gain resolution at the domain level in all of these epigenetic modifiers. And we conducted then a phenotypic screen. So we used the same reporter cell line that I have described to you. We added Cas9, and then we added the library, and before doing sequencing to look at the relative enrichment of the guide RNAs, we did sorting of the GFP low and high fractions, which are um, enriching for guide RNAs that, that are enriched or depleted in GFP, um, in MIS-1 high or low cells. So from, then we, from there, we could infer um, the dependencies that are different in these two fractions. And when we looked at the results, um, we found some potential repressors or activators of MIS-1. And if we focus on the red part uh, on the right, we did find, again, uh, .1L and ENL or ML and uh, ENL or AF9 um, that we found in our small molecule screen. And we could also find other known regulators of the Hox-MIS cluster. So we were pretty happy about that. And we were also very excited that we found uh, some more new candidates this time. So we wanted to confirm that we were seeing was a true signal. And for that, um, we did, we cloned the guide RNAs again, and um, we did um, arrayed CRISPR screens and, and saw um, here I'm showing you um, if MLLT1, which is also ENL, uh, could actually decrease the GFP signal if we did this again. So this is not in a pooled format anymore. We did this um, independently, and these are independent guide RNAs. So here we see that if we compare to non-targeting controls in gray, uh, the GFP signal does decrease. And we did this for our candidate regulators, and we saw that indeed the, the signal was real. We could see it again. 
And so this was a very um, you know, good sanity check that what we were seeing was true. And from here, we moved on to do a functional experiments. So we conducted proliferation assays and uh, we cloned these guides in a BFP color vector so that we could mix it with cells without the guide and really see uh, if uh, over time we would uh, look at a dropout of, uh, of the cells which had the guide RNA. So that would indicate for proliferative dependency. And we, we did see that for um, independent guides against these different regulators, we saw that over time there was a decrease in the BFP percentage in the population indicating for actual uh, proliferative dependency of these uh, candidate Hoxmis regulators in these AML cells. So we also had the question of what is actually um, underlying these functional dependencies of our kids. So our questions were like, well, um, are these genes only controlling Hoxmis? Uh, what is actually the whole transcriptional profile? Would the profiles, the transcriptional profiles of perturbing these genes be similar? Would uh, this indicate that they're working together? And this is a work in progress, so I'm not gonna go a lot into detail in this slide, but to answer these questions, one way could be to do bulk RNA-seq for each of these candidate regulators. And you can start thinking about um, doing knockouts and have like a triplicate for each of the regulators plus controls. So this would amount to like pr a pretty cumbersome experiment. So we thought about trying a new technique instead and we did CropSeq, uh, which is similar to Pertursic. And the concept here is that we can harness uh, single cell RNA-seq approaches um, and combine them with CRISPR to answer this question instead of doing bulk RNA-seq experiments for all of these regulators, do it in a pooled format. So this is basically the idea of the experiment and the questions that we wanted to answer. And we were pretty excited to see that um, once we did this uh, and, and cluster the perturbations of the transcription of profiles after perturbing these multiple regulators, some of them were close to each other and, um, and, and this actually follows some basis of what is already known about these regulators. And I'm going to leave it here. I'm not gonna go into more detail about this, but um, I'll refer to this uh, data a bit later. And uh, we're still um, analyzing this data set in collaboration with the Shendura lab that is helping us. Um, so I'll go back to our functional assay, this competition assay. Um, because here, um, I want to highlight that we found um, both subunits of the casein kindness to enzyme as independent hits in our screen. So as we wanted to narrow down the, the funnel and really decide to do more mechanistic experiments, we focused our attention on casein kinase too um, because of this. And this is just a snapshot of the bar plot I just showed you before of the proliferative dependency. And um, we know that CK2 has roles in Hox gene regulation um, from other organisms. So for instance, um, in insects and myriapods, the Hox gene homologs are controlled by CK2 and they, and then this is a good basis um, for us to follow. We know also from the literature that there could be potential avenues for CK2 to regulate Hox meets gene expression. It, could, it phosphorylates histone H3 directly, it might also, it, also phosphorylates uh, the hoxane and transcription factor, and it also phosphorylates KMT2A or MLL, which regulates um, hoxmis genes. So these could be potential avenues um, to explore further. And while keeping this in mind, what the first thing that we did was to um, try and see if treating with a CK2 inhibitor would um, cause a change in hoxmis um, expression in our in the systems we've been using. So we did see a concentration dependent decrease in GFP signal in the U937 reporter cell and we've been using our experiments. And we also saw a decrease in Hoxmis expression by qPCR when we treated with this inhibitor. Uh, in mouse leukemias, we also saw a decrease in the GFP signal and these leukemias are transformed with fusions that are, um, that enable a Hox upregulation. So they are Hox driven mouse leukemia cells. And when we compare, um, the effects of treating with inhibitor with a cell, a mouse leukemia that is non Hox driven, we do see that there is certain selectivity. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to see uh, the targets of these uh, enzyme um, 
as it is uh, akinase. So we did phosphoproteomics here um, with our phosphor with our proteomics core at SVP, and we saw that in the total proteome when we knock out uh, CK2, we do see a de uh, decrease in the protein levels of uh, subunit that we're knocking out, as well as the other subunit and um, certain um, Hox transcription factors. And when we look at the phosphoproteome, we were surprised to find that certain phosphopeptides, um, this peptide for MIS1, as well as a peptide of KMT2A, decrease uh, in their levels. So this could give us a basis of the regulation. Uh, in particular, for MIS1, uh, this phosphopeptide does have a CK2 um, motif, and, and it is decreasing. So right now, I'm conducting experiments really see if this activity is important in the initiation and ma or maintenance of the AML disease by um, different AF10 uh, fusions. And I wanted to recap here and summarize that so far, I've shown you that AF10 rearranged AMLs overexpress stemness signatures, um, including the Hoxmis gene cluster, and that we conducted unbiased compound and genetic phenotypic screening to find new epigenetic regulators of Hoxmis expression in a Calme F10 rearranged AML. And we have validated HITS for uh, transcriptional and anti-leukemia activity. And for CK2, we have demonstrated an inhibitor that is available and in phase two clinical trials, I think I forgot to mention that, can reverse Hox activation and show certain selectivity for Hox-driven AML. And we found that there could be a potential new mechanism aside from the ones that have already been reported in the literature for regulation of Hox-MIS genes by CK2, um, which could be direct MIS-1 uh, phosphorylation. And I, I forgot to paste the dendrogram, but from the dendrogram of the CropSeq data, we did find that um, CK2 and KMT2A deletions have a similar transcriptional profile. And um, from what I show you in the volcano plot from our phosphoproteomics experiment, we did see the decrease in uh, levels of KMT2A phosphopeptide when we knock out CK2. So right now, um, I'm parsing through these different avenues and, and seeing what is actually responsible for the downregulation that we see of Hoxmis genes when we knock out CK2. And um, here's where the project is so far. I would like now to acknowledge uh, my mentor, Ani Deshpande and Anaga Deshpande in my lab who has been working with me in, in this project. We've, we've both been working together, as well as um, our collaborators and the support from the course here at SPP and also the epigenomics core at um, UCSD, as well as my graduate program and uh, everyone here in this talk. Thank you very much for attending. And with this, I would like to take any questions. <laughs>